Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is gonna be a sort of a Q&A video where I'll be answering your questions which you asked me here on YouTube, then also on Patreon and on Instagram. For convenience, I grouped all these questions into three sections. First is personal questions, second is technical questions, and third is questions about hardware engineering career and study. So let me grab a coffee and let's get started. So I'm back. The first question is, why did you create this channel? So the original idea was to make hardware engineering field more popular and also to give more insights on the technologies behind chips and AI. You know, there are many channels which talk about hardware and chips, but the most of these channels are just covering news. So I made this channel for people who want to deep dive into those technologies so really understand them so how does the industry work and what are the trends and how to apply them basically i just created a geeky channel which i would like to watch by myself i mean this channel is also for people who are not exactly working in this field but who is eager to understand more in this technology is rather than just reading headlines. And I also wanted to build a community around this channel so we can discuss these technologies, share opinions, and I thought this would be great. How do you deal with the criticism in the comments? Honestly, I'm in the process of learning how to deal with it. I mean, if it's a constructive criticism, for instance, about the quality of my sound, this is the best feedback I can get. But if it's a, just a negative comment, for instance, about my appearance, I cannot say that I easily ignore it because I'm a, I'm a really sensitive person. So I just, I'm in the process of learning how to take it easy. Next one is, where are you from? So originally I'm from Moscow. I was born there and I got my first uh, computer engineering degree from the Moscow Engineering Physics University. And afterwards I moved to Austria to pursue a master's degree in electrical engineering. And I didn't plan that, but I stayed here. I have to say Austria is a really beautiful place to be um, because it is a beautiful nature and it's a great and high quality of life, but we pay like 50 to 55% tax here. I know, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> a part of technology, what interests you and why? First of all, investing. So since I'm getting my, so since I got a job and getting my salary, I was really into investing because I think it is an interesting thing overall and it is a smart way to mm, grow your fortune. Mm, then also I love reading books. I think books, uh, books are the great source of knowledge and you can learn literally anything by reading. So the last book I read was a pop science book on machine learning uh, called The Master Algorithm. I will show you now. So this book, then I'm a lot into workouts and eating healthy. Um, I think we should take a good care of our body because if we feel good, we can work good. And I just want to be strong and feel good and I want to be beautiful also. That's why I try always to make like three, four workouts a week and I'm following the hardcore plan. <laughs> and I also love to go cycling. I have a road bike, um, Canyon. I think cycling is a great cardio and it is extremely mm, meditative. So I love it. So many of you asked uh, what university did you go to and which company do you work? And another question, can you give a short summary of your career journey from the start of your education and the roles you've been in up until now? Are you allowed to disclose which companies you worked for? No. <laughs> so as I already mentioned, I got my first uh, bachelor's and master's degree in computer engineering uh, from Moscow Engineering Physics University. And while studying, I was working as a um, backend software developer. So I was working as a junior developer, so this job gave me enough money to, you know, to buy food and to buy underground tickets. So life was 
hard. And then right after graduation, I moved to Austria to pursue a master's degree in electrical engineering, specifically in integrated circuits design. And during my study, I made an internship in a semiconductor company and I developed a gate oxide test chip from the concept to circuits layout and to wafers. And it was quite successful, so these wafers are still running and they are still used to measure the quality of gate oxide. So those were eight crazy years of my life. I mean, I was thinking about PhD and maybe I am still thinking about PhD. Who knows? Who knows? Um, regarding the company where I work, I often get asked this question and I cannot answer this. And anyway, whatever I say in my videos is only my personal opinion and it should not be associated to any company. Anyway, the company where I work is one of the biggest chip makers and it is very, very successful. So you know it. I'm working on the development of automotive chips, so chips which go in cars. And I'm in the digital design team. So far I have about five years of working experience, so I'm a senior engineer. The next question is from Patreon. How did you learn investing? Uh, which stocks should I buy now? So first of all, thank you a lot for supporting my channel at the big bang level. I really appreciate it. Uh, so if you guys want to support this channel and me creating videos, uh, the link to the Patreon is in the description below. And also I made this channel joinable. Back to the question. So I think reading is a great way to learn anything. So I was reading many books on investments. For instance, The Intelligent Investor, Little Book of Common Sense Investment by John Bogle. John Bogle is the founder of Vanguard. And another book by him is Enough. In two words, my strategy is to invest 25-30% of my salary monthly. And the strategy is to buy and hold forever okay not forever but for decades so a large part of my money is in etfs like standard etfs so semiconductor etfs and like s p 500 and also i have stocks like different semiconductor companies and for instance tsmc and for sure i invest in tesla and i own some crypto too uh, recently, like last couple of months, I'm a lot into that, so I'm really reading a lot. So I'm buying also some not that well-known crypto, which I don't recommend you to do. <laughs> Advice for a young woman looking to pursue your path. Be persistent. Be persistent because I believe that with effort and perseverance, everything is possible. Do you know the book Grit? This book, it is a sort of inspiring, if I can say that. Uh, so check out this book and of course, watch my videos. Where I am, barely any women go into hardware engineering. Is this true where you grew up? And if so, what drove you to do it anyway? Have you faced much sexism? Yes, this is true. There are not many women in the hardware engineering field. Um, but I see it's changing and it's gonna change. And I wish my channel inspired more women to go in hardware engineering. What drove you to do it anyway? I was interested in microelectronics and in particular in digital design and how this works and how to build chips. And so I can say that this curiosity was my internal motivation and it still is. Have you faced sexism? So, in my professional life, I do not face sexism at all. It is really comfortable to work with guys and it's really fun. But here on YouTube, I often get offensive comments, like about my appearance or just stereotypes, you know, or just biased comments that I'm a girl talking about tech, how I can talk about tech. Um, what I can say, uh, here I am. It is 21st century and I'm a girl talking about tech and it's fun. How long does it take to make a video? Do you make it all on your own? Um, this depends on the video. I would say approximately 40 hours per video. So usually I do research 
uh, about for about 20 hours and I will write a small script for the video and then it will take me maybe two hours to set up my uh, shooting setting and to film the video and then it will take me about 10 hours to edit it and to upload it. So making tech videos is much harder than it may look. Um, basically now it takes pretty much all my free time <laughs> but I do plan to outsource at least video editing to get more free time for myself and for maybe creative tasks but I'm not there yet. How do you look back on your time studying? Mm. To put it in one word, it was hard. Especially my second degree, so electrical engineering degree, was particularly challenging. I mean, the program and the course load was really tough. So we started like 17 people and only four people finished. And I'm proud that I'm one of them. I mean, it took me a lot of hard work to get where I am right now. This is gonna be the last question and then we go to technical questions. So where do you read tech news? So my favorites are IEEE Spectrum and IEEE Explorer. And also they have a journal. So this is the October edition and they have a special uh, edition on the AI and deep learning, like why AI is so dumb. <laughs> and here is a nice article on how the deep learning works. I already broke the journal, so... Ah. And also I like EE Times and uh, Semiconductor Engineering. So I have these uh, websites and other journals set up in the Feedly app. And then I will just read it here. Okay, so enough is enough. Now it's time for technical questions. What is the difference between chips used for AI and normal usage? Can you share your thoughts on this? So to make it simple, there are architectural differences. So if we talk about AI chip, the most of the area is taken by NPUs, so neural processing units. What is it? This is a specialized matrix multiplication processors, which can perform arithmetic operations like multiplications and additions very fast. This is needed to run neural networks. On the other hand, general purpose CPUs, just from laptops, are designed for different kind of applications. So running machine learning algorithms on these CPUs simply not efficient. While GPUs is something in between here because they have large arithmetic modules which are also suitable for machine learning. That's why Tesla was using an NVIDIA A100 GPUs for neural network training before the era of Dojo. What do you think future historians will say were the best worst technical developments of the 21st century? So this is a good one. It is just started and we still have the most of the century to go. Anyway, even though the microchips were initially invented in 20th century, I would still say microchips. You cannot send people to space without microchips and autonomous driving is happening thanks to microchips. I would say microchips are definitely the number one inventions of the 21st century because they are at the heart of everything and they're at the heart of every technology. Also, I'm pretty excited about IoT, so Internet of Things, because everything is getting connected and it's pretty cool because soon my fridge will be able to order food on its own and I think it's pretty cool. And I'm pretty sure that human level AI will, so artificial general intelligence, will happen in this 21st century. I just do not know if it's a good or a bad thing. During the fabrication of the Dodge chip, the entire wafer is of 25 chips. If just one of the chips on the wafer fails, is the whole wafer junk? What do you believe they would have for parameters to accept the wafer to be put in the Dojo cabinets? Is it likely 100% performance across all the chips on the wafer? And what do you think the yield success rate will be if that is the case? I don't think it is a problem because 
they have an interconnect in all the direction and if one chip fails they can root around it actually the reason why they do not fabricate dojo of the size of a wafer is exactly the yield that's why they put 25 uh, chips on an interconnect wafer. So in this case, they can select the good chips to go for this integration. Because the larger the chip, the higher the probability of defect in it. The Dojo is fabricated by TSMC in 7 nanometer technology node. And I've heard that this node has a really great yield. They have something about 0.09 defects per square centimeter which means more than 95% of yield which is uh, awesome. Do you see any limit to the shrinking apparent line width? Would 0.9 nanometers, so one angstrom, ever be possible or should we just switch metrics? So earlier this year there were news from IBM and TSMC that they achieved 2 nanometer process node and TSMC already achieved 1 nanometer process node. And I also made a video about this. So when we are thinking about technology node, we traditionally think that the number, so for instance in 28 nanometer nodes, represent the gate length of the device. However, when we talk about nodes which are below, let's say, 16 nanometers, this thinking doesn't work anymore. So, traditionally for a technology node, the node number in nanometers represents a gate length. For instance, 16 nanometer means 16 nanometer gate length. However, when we go below, let's say, 16 nanometer technology, this kind of thinking doesn't work anymore. For instance, for technologies like gate all around, if we are talking about 3 nanometer nodes, there is actually nothing much of 3 nanometers there. So it's just a marketing number which represents the certain performance of the transistor. So if you want to know details, I have a video about this. You may like to check it out here. I will link it here. So you ask if 0.1 nanometer transistors, transistors of a size of one angstrom are possible. Yes, and yes, there is still room for uh, scaling down. What is your take on neuromorphic hardware? Does it have the potential to be commercial in the coming years? Very good question. I'm planning to make a video about this. But to my understanding, neuromorphic computing is an emerging field. So filled with a lot of potential. Neuromorphic chips are basically brain-inspiring computing at a very low power. Because, you know, our brain is super power efficient. And if you can get this kind of AI at a low power, this would be great but we are not there yet. So moving neuromorphic compute to the edge will really open up many exciting applications. Commercializing, um, again, I think we are not there yet. Anyway, I'm planning to make a video about neuromorphic chips and I want to, to talk about some of the existing products. For instance, there is a neuromorphic chip by Intel Labs, which is already a product. So stay tuned. What do you think about quantum computing? Of course, I think it is a really interesting field. You know, there are many different ways how you can implement the qubit. And the favorite of mine is when you integrate qubit in the standard CMOS technology. And I think the first practical quantum computers will be done like this. Actually, I have a video on quantum computers in my list as well. Do you think Tesla FSD will succeed to level 5? So level 5 is a full automation, which means it doesn't require any interaction from a human. Yes, I think they will in maybe some years, like five or seven years, because it's really not an easy task and they have everything to succeed. But there are also other companies which are working in this direction and also making pretty awesome progress. Uh, for instance, some of the Chinese companies, if you're interested to know more, you can check out this video. So now I would like to answer questions regarding the hardware engineering career, study and work. So the first question is, will AI ever replace humans in chip design? I don't want to end up jobless. <laughs> so no, this is not happening. So do not trust the media, okay? So AI is a great assist and it will improve and will taking maybe more tasks. So it will be a 
sort of a assistance, but not more than that. So don't worry. Actually, I have a whole video talking about if AI will ever replace humans in chip design. So I will link it here. If you're interested, you can check it out later. Advice for electrical engineering students, undergrads who want to go for higher studies, studies in hardware engineering field. So the first tip here is to make internships during your study. You need to figure out what is it you would like to do and to strive uh, to get an internship in the field because internship will help you to figure out uh, many things and it will also look very nice in your CV. It will help you to land a job eventually. And also during your internship, you can build up a professional network, which will also help you to get a job. And second thing here, try to get in the field which has a great potential, which is merging field. For instance, now it is chip design, so IC design, AI chips, silicon photonics, quantum computing, in-memory compute, so this kind of stuff. What was were your favorite subjects you enjoy the most at university during your electrical and computer engineering course? So definitely digital design course, analog design course, so analog one, and HDL courses, so hardware description languages courses. Those I think I enjoy the most. And also I was really into programming, so I loved C and Assembler. What was the hardest course you had? Actually, the hardest are always my favorites. So I think the hardest were analog one, and analog RF design, so RF design courses. Which subfield in the electrical measure will have more opportunities in coming 10 years? So definitely chip design and IC design, RF design, uh, RF design, so silicon photonics and AI. And then I got a comment in Russian, so I'm gonna read it in Russian, then translate it in English, and then answer it. Настя, расскажи про жизнь в Австрии. Другой ли здесь немецкий? Теплее ли здесь зима, чем в Москве? В Австрии признаются российские технические дипломы? So, tell about life in Austria. Is it warmer here in winter than in Moscow? Are Russian technical diplomas recognized in Austria? So, about the life in Austria. I think the climate is softer and warmer here in comparison to Russia, for sure. But we do still have winter. I would say it is about, on average, 10 degrees warmer than in Moscow. I think Austria is a really beautiful country. And nature is really super beautiful like this mountains and lakes it is something which you can imagine about switzerland so it is very similar to switzerland here and yes uh, russian engineering degrees are recognized and acceptable here for sure i think it is well known for everyone that russia has a very strong engineering school so if you want to move here and continue your study here you would need to provide a language certificate like yals or toffel past TOEFL and if you want to move to work here it's also possible but just you need to know the language so English English is actually enough you do not need to know German to work in a tech company here because there are many many international people and the most of the meetings are in English highest paying job in hardware <laughs> obviously CTO so chief technical advisor but overall your salary depends on your proportional to your responsibilities so if you're responsible for a small task it is one salary if you are responsible for a block it is another salary if you're responsible for the whole chip like a chip architect this is a different level because there is only one chip architect and usually it's a person with a very high global grade but in order to do this job, you need at least 15 years plus of experience. The most interesting fields in analog domain and the future of analog and mixed signal design. Well, if we talk about analog design, I think RF communication is the future because everything is getting wirelessly connected and we start to use higher and higher frequencies so rf designers are definitely in demand about the future of analog and mixed signal design i think that 
it will become more and more mixed signal and less and less analog. So analog designers will have to learn digital. There are also a lot of effort in the development of the so-called analog generators. The idea is similar to the digital design flow. So you code as the circuit and parameters and then the design, the circuit and the layout is generated. So I think this is the future. What is your advice for students pursuing a career in hardware electronics? Which technologies are going to be a must-have skill for future candidates pursuing a career in hardware field? This depends on the job, but I would say in general you need a solid background in electronics as well as some programming skills. So you need to understand the hardware and in order to design hardware you need to know some software. So HDA languages, so hardware description languages like System Verilog, and you need to have some scripting skills. On top of that you need to learn how to solve problems and it would be great to learn some basics in machine learning and AI as well. Okay, I think I will stop here because I'm pretty much tired. I think it's going to be a long video. So sorry if I didn't answer your question and I hope you enjoyed the video and leave me a comment below which videos you would like to see on this channel because I do plan a video on neuromorphic chips and quantum computers. Also, I want to make one video on the more slow, so talking technology notes and for sure I will be covering Tesla tech as soon as anything interesting pops up. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Ciao!